in things infinite and the power lying in the infinite and our need to draw the infinite into this finite arena. That's what we need. And then these men, one by one, begin to bring their fire and to bring the hammer of the Word of God and strike that thing one more time. And here we find ourselves in the middle of a call to righteousness and purity and prayer. Brother Marx was talking last night about the process. The triumphant entry begins with praise down the mountain into the city. He cleans the house for purity. And then he heals the blind and the lame. He's talking about process. There is no sharper image of process in the Word of God than the tabernacle. And where we are standing tonight, this morning, is at the altar of incense, which in that Old Testament type is a type of prayer and praise. And we're standing at the veil. And inside the veil, pure mercy, perfect authority, perfect fellowship with the touching of the wings of the cherubim, perfect provision in the manna, perfect authority in the rod of Aaron, and the Word of God that never changes. Prayer is the portal. It's the opening of that dynamic into the infinite. It is the most rudimentary or elemental entryway into what we desperately need. How many of you want to be a receiver, a finder, an opener? Thank you, Brother Booker. Thank you, Brother Marks. Thank you, Brother Godwin. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We love and appreciate Brother Nathaniel Wilson. There is no one doing greater work out on the edge, the cutting edge of apostolic theology. There's nobody doing better work out on the point of the spear of where God is taking His church today. And we are so blessed to be standing in the presence of God. And we love Brother Wilson. We want him to come and take his liberty. Brother Nathaniel Wilson, Bishop of the Rock Church in Sacramento, California. Take your liberty. We love you. Amen. Appreciate it. Uh, let's praise him again. Amen. Thank you, Brother Booker, for what we just heard. Amen. Thank you, Brother Godwin, for last night. That was so on and fearless. Thank you, Brother Marks. For challenging us these are men that are not novices that I personally have been acquainted with for a long time Brother Booker and I have been in the same bunkhouse on the same ranch for 30 years and Brother Godwin's preached many times at the Rock Church Brother Marks just concluded a four month revival or five month I don't know whatever it was uh, at the Rock Church which scores of people received the Holy Ghost and scores of things happened that we couldn't even describe and makes it his home church and we appreciate them very much appreciate the sponsors of this conference <clears throat> which over the last 16 years has helped to reshape, whether you are for or against, it has helped to reshape the thinking of a region and um, deal with it. It's not going away. Right. Amen. And uh, helped us to think progressively. Amen. And we have a lot of friends in Alabama who we uh, 
think just the highest of and appreciate all of you people who are here today and the people that are supposed to be here today that I'm supposed to preach to uh, will be here and um, we don't worry about everybody else. Amen? Praise God. I want to preach to you for a little while this morning in these challenging times. I want to preach to you from Luke chapter 1. If you have your Bible, Luke chapter 1. One. My subject is, Mary, can you do these two? Mary, can you do these two? I'm going to preach about Mary, the mother of Jesus. And um, what I'm preaching is for Mary, but by extension, it is to all of us that are here today. In Luke chapter 1, verse 26, it says, And in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God, and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. And this son, he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his Father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And then in verse 38, and Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. And then I want to read to you, you don't have to turn to this, it's uh, just a short line and a half. From Galatians chapter 4, verse 19, it says, My little children, of whom I travail in birth again, until Christ be formed in you. So Paul here is kind of doing a little bit of what I'm doing, I think. He perhaps was thinking of Mary when he said, My little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. And I'm sure that Paul knew Mary. They were both in the early church together. And so he uses this in a uh, metaphoric way. My little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. And I want to preach to you, Mary, can you do these two? Let's pray the Lord will touch us in the next 30 minutes or so. Would you pray with me out loud? God, I thank you for your presence that is here today. And I thank you for your spirit that is in this room. And I pray that you would reach and touch us with the Holy Ghost. Do a special work amongst us, dear God, in all of these people that are here and all that would hear this message. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I don't know that there's many things that Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis said that I would quote, but here is one of them. She said, if you bungle raising your children, if you bungle raising your children, I don't think whatever else you do well matters very much. And so... <clears throat> When we look at this story of the birth of Jesus and this girl, Mary, we do not know some details about her, but we do know that she was a normal girl that had a normal father and mother. 
Speculation would lead us to believe that she probably was spiritually sensitive and that she had a deep concern about things spiritual. That's an assumption. We can't particularly prove that, although there would probably be indicators in Scripture that would lead to that. Uh, certainly she was not, uh, as the Catholic Church teaches, something that was beyond being normal human. Um, she was a normal girl. There are estimates that this girl may have been as young as 14 years old when she had this supernatural experience recorded in Luke chapter 1. Now there's, there's a there's all kinds of stuff to preach out of Luke chapter 1, which is a chapter which juxtaposes the birth of Jesus with the birth of John the Baptist, his cousin. And the response, it's an interesting study, um, the contrast of the response of Zacharias um, and the response of Mary to, or Zechariah, to the same angel with the same message that they're both going to have a son. And Zechariah's response creates doubt, and Mary's response embraces the announcement of the angel. When Mary, I don't know where Mary was when this angel came to her, our text just simply tells us the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city in Galilee named Nazareth. I have been to Nazareth. Uh, Nazareth, there's things over there are so old. Um, Jacob's well, who preceded Mary being at Nazareth in this story by... Uh, some 15, 18, 1900 years, Jacob's well is still there and is still in use. And uh, there are things are just really, really old. When you get there, I don't know if it's true or not, this is the place where most of the Samaritans live. There's only 600 Samaritans left in the world uh, when I was there, and they told me this, and 400 of those 600 live in uh, Nazareth, uh, and have, and which I saw, uh, a roll of the first five books of the Bible that they say is original, that dates all the way back to the days of Moses. Now, I don't, I have a little hard time believing that, but uh, there was no question of the antiquity of this roll that they treasure and almost worship. And in this city, which is not a big city, uh, which is a, just a ragged uh, city where there's high poverty and, um, and was so in the days of Jesus. In this mundane, uh, unexpected place of Mary's life, living there, I don't know what her mom and dad did for a living, but they lived in Nazareth evidently, and she is there and she has met a boy Name Joe that she likes and they are dating and uh, they are in a state of life in which the older people would look at them and say uh, they're just like flesh uh, or fresh uh, florets they they're like flowers in bloom they're just kids they don't know much they are un they have no particular knowledge of life they they haven't come to the um, to the more robust well balanced ideas of, that adults understand. And in the midst of all that, to this teenage girl comes um, an angel, uh, not only an angel, but one of the two primary angels found in the, entire, in the entirety of the record of heaven's dealings with man. This angel Gabriel comes to this, uh, this teenage girl. I, I don't think there's any doubt she was a teenager. Uh, but probably a quite young teenage girl. And, of course, in those days maybe girls grew up a little quicker and boys too and began working more as adults in earlier in life. But 
Whatever the case may be, to this girl comes this angel, Gabriel, and this angel speaks to her. It is an unusual experience that will, um, uh, that will, that is exciting and that is different. And Mary is in, probably radically intrigued, as you and I would be, by what is happening. And, and uh, we're looking at this scene through a window of time, so to speak, as recorded by Luke. Uh, probably this record is uh, about as exact as you could get. If you read the book of Luke, most uh, scholars will tell you that Luke got his account uh, mostly from the women that followed Jesus. Uh, and so there's a special emphasis on women in the book of Luke because uh, that this is the, the site at which uh, Luke got most of his material but was by interviewing and talking to probably for many hours these women. Uh, Luke is the one that lets us know that there were many women that followed Jesus and some of them were women whose husbands were high up in the Roman government and they followed him while he was uh, teaching on the shores of Galilee through Capernaum and Judea and so forth and helped support him and cooked for him and, and, and took care of his needs. And so uh, when we get Luke's account of what happens with Mary, there's probably a, a very, very little doubt that the account is as exacting as is possible. And so Mary is excited about this, this announcement, this visitation from this angel. And I... I, I'm excited for her, but when I look at her, I want to say, uh, Mary, uh, you're, you're, you're 14 or 15 or 16, and, and, and Mary, uh, I'm uh, 63, and um, now I'm looking back with the experience of looking back on your life now that is already passed and many years ago, and I'm looking back at what happened through all of this, and I, I want to say, Mary, I'm glad that you're excited about this, but do you understand what all of this is going to do to the rest of your life. Because when, when you met this angel and you had this spiritual experience, from that point forward there will never again be the kind of life that you would have had that all of your aunts and uncles have had who lived in Nazareth and all of the other people who live in Cana, which is only three or four miles from Nazareth, and all of the people that are there together that have... Uh, a, 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 a history, a tradition, a heritage, a cultural familiarity with one another. When you have this angelic experience and when this announcement is made to you from that point forward, Mary, uh, I want you to enjoy the exhilaration of the moment. But from that point forward, your life will be impacted in ways that you have no idea, no conceivable idea of what this is going to do to your life. And so not only does she have an announcement, she has an announcement that she is going to have a baby. And um, I, 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 it's a remarkable announcement that she's going to have a baby because she was old enough to know about the facts of life. And so she says, well, I've never known a man. How am I going to have a baby. She knows how the human race um, uh, reproduces and how the human race continues to exist and, and, uh, and uh, families are born and move on through life. And so um, uh, she's excited about babies because women get excited about babies. And men get excited about babies, but men don't get as excited about babies as women get excited about babies. Well, some men do, but not most men don't get as excited about babies as women do about babies. And um, I've got a really insightful uh, uh, statement to make here. Men don't have babies. And, uh, and so um, I don't know if anything makes a woman happier than having a baby uh, I, 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 or being around babies or their kids having babies or, uh, or other people's kids having babies. In fact, women are, are, are a wonder to behold. They just love babies. They don't care. Uh, if they're, they just love babies. They don't care if they're white babies, black babies, green babies, purple babies, yellow babies, but brown babies. They just love. They just love babies. And 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 there is no event. Brother Godwin preached last night about the birth of of, of his children. But there is no event in human affairs that has more wonder attached to it than 
a baby. And doctors that deliver babies will tell you that no matter how many babies they've delivered, the wonder of life when that baby cries and comes into this world never ceases to be as, as, as uh, wonder-inducing the 10,000th time as it was the first time. And uh, this is the exclusive territory of women that um, uh, men, uh, men, for you that don't know this, I thought I'd let you know, men can never be mothers. And um, I know for some of you that's a revelation, but men can never be mothers. Uh, it's the exclusive territory of women, that women have babies. And, that, and so Mary is happy. And Mary is excited. And Mary hears this announcement and then, probably without knowing anything about all the implications of it, she says, be it unto me, be it unto the handmaid of the Lord, uh, according to thy word. And so Mary now is expecting a baby, having never known a man. There's a supernatural uh, event. Luke 1, 35, that which is conceived in thee is of the Holy Ghost. That holy thing that is conceived in thee is of the Holy Ghost. And Joseph knows about this, and he knows where it came from, and she knows where it came from, that it is a supernatural event, but nobody else knows where it came from except Joseph and Mary. And so before the baby is ever born, controversy enters the life of Mary. And this girl who has this baby that is not by natural conception, not by the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, nor of blood, but it is by the will of God that this baby is found in her womb. Now, I pastored a woman who became pregnant, and this is a number of years ago, and she came to the office for counsel, and she said, I know, Brother Wilson, that you think that I have probably been immoral, but I haven't. I am like Mary. This baby is of the Holy Ghost. And I had to explain to her that I was an unbeliever. But in the case of Mary, I am not an unbeliever. I know that this happened the way that it is recorded. And so from the time that she finds out she's expecting, there is an unavoidable tension that enters into her life. And there is a stigmata, a stigma attached to her spiritually being used of God. And as her belly expands and as her dresses can no longer hide the fact that she's expecting, and Nazareth being a small town and everybody knowing everybody, my dad used to tell me, son, when you get older, don't live in a small town. Live in a big town. He said, in a small town, everybody knows your business. And so I took him at his word. But she is getting larger. And then there are whisperings. Now, when this announcement comes that she's going to have this baby, I ask her the first question, Mary, can you believe? And she says, oh, yes, I can believe. Be it unto me, as the word of the Lord has stated. I believe. And the baby is conceived. And it grows. The whisperings begin. Just stop and think. Who's going to believe that in history there's never been a baby born this way? Who is going to believe her? In Nazareth, a nondescript town from a nondescript family, from a not elite girl in, in earthly terms. And she says, but, uh, uh, but 
uh, uh, but the baby is, uh, things aren't like uh, it appears to be. They're not like you think they are. And all of the women <coughs> at the wash day down by the well <coughs> are saying, yeah, right. Yeah, right. And so no matter what she said, some would never believe different. And so Mary learns before the baby, I am am preaching to somebody today, and Mary learns before the baby is ever born, before the baby is ever born, Mary, you got a lot ahead of you, girl, but before the baby's ever born, she is living with misperceptions, And, and she is living with judgmentalism. And she is living with criticism. And she is finding out that the flesh craves finding weakness in the strong. And she is, as a girl, she's hardly got started in life. But she's already caught up in being tagged with whispers that she in her whole life never would escape, that people thought that she was a loose girl, that that one of the worst uh, one of the worst gossip that could ever be put on a girl is put upon Mary and her frustration in trying to explain that uh, it's it's not like you think it is, and them looking at her like. Girl, you're talking to grown women. You're, you're not going to get by with this. And not being able, no matter how articulate she was, not being able to extricate herself from the stigma of birthing the Savior of the world. And so now... I say, Mary, can you still believe? And she says, yes, yes. That's the only question I had, but now I have another question. Mary, can you do these two? Can you still believe? And can you forgive those who will never get the story straight? And the baby has not yet been born. And then the happy day comes that the baby is born. And when the baby is born, nobody has ever had a birth like this baby's birth. There are angels singing or proclaiming that there is peace on earth, goodwill toward men, announcing the greatness of her child and what is going to happen because of his birth. And, and this baby she has is innocent. And in a way that I can, ladies, that I can only, from a clumsy father's viewpoint and grandfather, She holds that innocent, cuddly baby, the product of intense labor, and she loves that baby that was a part of herself in a way that men don't know. That gives an attachment that is uh, inexplicable. That gives a a level of love that is absolutely without bias, just loves unequivocally. And so she has her baby, and she's excited. But her baby's not born at home. She's not at home when this baby's born. She's in a strange place when this baby is born 
you know, we're out of our home right now because of uh, smoke damage. We've been out for a month. It's a horrible way to live from pillar to post and motel to your kids' homes and back again. And it's a, a woman loves, a woman is nesting. Men are, but not like women. And, and she is going to have this baby, but her baby is not going to be birthed at home. In fact, when she births her baby, think about this, ladies, her baby is born into a world, a manger. Her baby is born into a place where animals are fed and where there is waste and where there is uh, disease and where there is risk. At, her baby is born there and from that she is put there and now the baby is is making demands on her that she's actually in a stable because of the baby in a place of disease, in a place of risk, in a place of waste. But at least she has her baby and she loves her baby as only a mother could love her baby. And a little bit of time passes and then because of her baby, Herod is going to kill all the babies. The baby's stepfather, Joseph, has a dream. And God speaks to him and says, take the baby to Egypt. To Egypt. To Egypt. Of all places. I've never been to Egypt. I've barely been to Jerusalem. To Egypt. And so Mary, because of the baby, has to take her baby with her husband and grab the few articles that they can carry on their animal vehicle, their mode of travel, and go all the way down. I rode a bus from Israel to Egypt across the desert. When I think of crossing that desert, with donkeys, it's practically unimaginable. And she's going to go to Egypt because of the baby. And it's a strange land. And they speak a different language. And she's never been to Egypt. And she don't know anything about Egypt. And so when she gets there, it's a strange people. Their dress is different. Their food is different. Their language is different. Their culture is different. There's a history of hostility towards her people from the people that are in Egypt. But now she's there and it's all because of the baby. And the honor of motherhood is being replaced by the burden and the babies affecting everything in their life. And now life is no longer about her and Joseph. It's all about the baby. She has no roots. She can't show her baby to the relatives because she's in Egypt. Aunt Betty can't see the baby. Grandma and Grandpa are dying to see the baby, but the baby's in Egypt. And it's a situation where everybody's not happy and everything's not fair and people are jumping to conclusions. And she already bears the stigma of child out of wedlock. And i got to ask you, Mary, in that little hovel in Egypt, hearing language you don't understand, eating food you've never tasted, with customs that are totally alien to you, can you still believe? And secondly, can you still forgive? God, how did you get me in this mess? Joseph, how did... Can you still believe and can you still forgive? She finally gets back home. When she gets back home, she again faces the stigma of a baby born out of wedlock. 
Yeah. Down at the wash day by the well. You know they left because of the shame. Yeah, they moved completely out of the country. Did you hear they're back? No. She's back. Why the audacity to come back after what she did? You didn't know? What are you ladies talking about? We're talking about Mary and her baby and Joseph. Oh, I know Mary and Joseph have a baby. Oh, you didn't know that's not Joseph's baby? No, I didn't know that. Oh, no, that's not Joseph's baby. And on and gone it goes. It just continues. But where else is she going to go? And so she goes back to Nazareth. And when she gets there, she says to herself, maybe it will be okay. And they settle in. And she just puts up with it all. And the years go by. And it's uneventful. But everything is pretty well on an even keel. And over the years, other children are born. Eventually, if you look in the Bible, you will find that there were at least nine people in the family of Jesus. There was Joseph and Mary. And then there was Jesus. He was the oldest child. Just want to make sure you can figure that out. And then he had four brothers. They were named James and Joseph, Simon, and Judas. The Bible names them. Tells us who they were. And then he had two sisters. It doesn't give their names, but it does say sisters, plural. So there may have been more than nine in this family. But there was at least five boys, two girls, and Joseph and Mary. It was a blended family. One of them was a half-brother. And in a blended family, sometimes you find peace. But more percentages than not, you find disruption. Where one feels like favoritism is being shown. Oh, how many families I know and are running through my mind that we have worked with and have to work with even when I get home. That are blended family issues. And favoritism is being shown here because that's your kid. And favoritism being shown. And all that goes with that. And maybe one of the sisters saying to the older brother just under Jesus, You know, bro, isn't our oldest brother a little strange? Yeah, seems like he is. Let's ask mom about that. And so they talk about it, and there's conflict in the home, perhaps. And mom tries, I don't know how mom did it. They know there's mystery attached to their older brother. And they know there's some unknowns attached to their older brother. And where there's mystery and where there's unknown, there's almost always fear. And fear looks for a reason. And when it finds a reason that it supposes is the truth, it acts on it, and oftentimes it's wrong, because fear and these reasons are usually not sound. And so here they don't know. They don't know. They just know. Do you think Mom knew some other man before Daddy? Well, I don't. She says not. She says that he is uh, born without a earthly daddy and she says what yeah that's what mom says and she says that the Holy Ghost overshadowed her and that he is going to be great oh yeah and so he is born of God yeah and you mean we came out of the same womb as God in flesh well, look, sis, you'll have to ask mom about all that. I don't know. And Mary's washing dishes and can hear all this going on and the frustration, the conflict. Joseph comes in from the shop that night and finds her in the bedroom quickly wiping her eyes. He says, Mary, what's wrong? She says, I'm just trying to hold all these relationships together in this blended family. It's a problem. It's a hassle. But then, thank God, one day, he leaves. 
Maybe there will be peace now. He's gone. The fact is, though, he goes and finds his strange second cousin, John the Baptist, who's even stranger than he is. And a little fear comes to her. Is what is she doing with him? He lives out in the wilderness like some kind of ecological freak. And he goes to him and she hears him. He gets baptized. And then he goes away and he's gone for 40 days. Luke 4. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit unto Galilee. That's where Nazareth is. And there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And Mary sees him in her town. And she says, My boy, maybe now they will see what he really is. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he would opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel of the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book. And he gave it again to the minister, whom I'm sure he had known for many years. And he sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And they're looking at him strangely. And I'm sure his mother was there that day. Our oldest brother's back in town. We've got to be sure and go to church. He's going to be reading today. And Joseph was there. And James was there. And Simon was there. And Judas was there. And Joseph was there. And the sisters are there. And they hear their brother read. And they watch him as in a rather pretentious and forward way. They can sense, and everybody else can too, that he's applying these Old Testament scriptures to himself. Homeboy applying Messianic scriptures to himself. And every eye is in shock and is upon him. And Mary's heart is beating slowly as she waits to see what will happen next. And all bear him witness, verse 22, and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son, my boy? I know now they're going to embrace him. And he said, Jesus speaks up, the family's listening, everybody else is too. Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. He read their minds. And then he gives two examples to them of people who did accept prophets. And both of them are dogs. One of them is a Gentile heathen woman. The other are lepers. And they get the message that her boy is indicting them. And all they in the synagogue, verse 28, listen closely to me, that's the neighbors. This isn't some strange city. The neighbors. All they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him into the brow of the hill whereon the city was built that they might...
cast him down headlong. And as the mob, the vigilante crew, drags him along through the city, Mary is there. Her frustrated sons are there with a mixture of anger and horror. The family follows along, watching their neighbors take their brother and drag him to the edge of a hill. And they don't know what to do. And Mary's saying, Joseph, you've got to do something. And he looks and says, Mary, the leader of that mob is John. And I just made some plow handles for him last week. Can't you talk to him? And they take her boy. This is the neighbors. And I have to say, Mary, when the neighbors don't understand, can you still believe? And when the neighbors don't understand, can you forgive? And then she's even more amazed. But he, passing through the midst of them, went his way. Somehow he got out. The family is embarrassed. People are talking about it on the street the next day. Mary's boy is creating chaos. And so he leaves there. Just walk with me. It's not going to get any better. Actually, it's going to get worse. He leaves there, and he goes to Capernaum, which isn't far away. I was just there last year, and there's a dip in the hills, a swale in the hills, where you walk a trail where Jesus, the swale was there in his day, a little dip in the hills, a pass. You walk from Nazareth and you walk up and you walk through that pass and you walk down by come down by the west side of the Sea of Galilee and you walk up northeast until you come to the top of the Sea of Galilee to Capernaum and there we find him teaching and this is what the Bible says and they are astonished at his doctrine and her son is entering a dimension that other people are uncertain with. It's in that shadowy world of spirit. While he's there, he meets an unclean devil and a demon-possessed man. And he talks to the devil and says, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And the devil, after he throws the man, comes out of him. And the Bible says, And they were all amazed. Son, can't you do just be normal and quit bringing all of the controversy and chaos everywhere you go. And in Matthew 13, this is what they said about him. Verse 55, is not this the carpenter's son? Listen closely. Is not his brethren James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters? Are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man these things? And the swirl gets greater. And then John 7 tells us in verse 1, Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brethren therefore said unto him, This is not the disciples, this is not the apostles, this is his earthly brethren. They're dealing with, what, what am I going to do with, with him? He's embarrassing us. The authorities are displeased with him. The neighbors are talking about him. Mom, your son is a nut. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brethren, therefore, said unto him, Depart hence. Would you just get out and go into Judea? I mean, if you're who you say you are, go to Judea that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest, so that people don't think you're crazy. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself 
seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. For neither did his brethren believe in him. You've got to get out there and prove that you're who you say you are. And get this stigma off our back that we didn't ask for. And mom didn't ask for. But you brought it on us. And they go up, and he won't go with them. He goes up a few days later. Oh, yeah, that's just like him. He can't cooperate with the rest of us. And there was much murmuring among the people concerning him. I'm reading from the Bible. And then he teaches when he gets there in the temple in Jerusalem and creates more controversy. And now there's riots. And Mary is watching all this and then it gets so bad that standing at the temple steps, they spit out the words to Jesus, Thou hast a devil. And there's anger everywhere. And there's anger in Nazareth. And there's anger in Jerusalem. And there's anger in the temple. There's anger in the apostolic movement. Mary, can you do these two? Can you still believe? Can you still forgive? And so she hears him maligned, and this is what is said successively. He is mad. Your son, woman, is insane. He is demon-possessed. She hears people say this about her boy, and her heart says, No, he's not. I know. She doesn't know she said it out loud, and people look at her strangely. She shrinks back in the crowd. He is irresponsible. He's a loser. He's a party animal. He's a wine bibber. He's a glutton. His own family said he is beside himself. And Mary listens to this with misunderstandings of every kind. And with the kids saying, I remember when my brother came home from school one day, and this is a microcosm by far, I know that, but, and he said to my mother and father when we were both in high school, Mom, Dad, you've got to stop my brother from preaching to everybody. They think he's a religious nut. Luke 8, 19, then came his mother and brethren standing without, outside of the group, the crowd, standing without, sent unto him, calling him. Because there were so many people pressed around him, his mom and brothers could not even get to him. And they sent to him, son, would you go tell him that his mother and brethren are seeking him? He's making a fool out of himself. We're taking him home once and for all. We'll put him in the basement and lock him down. Somebody brings him the message. Thy mother and thy brethren seek thee. I'm reading from the Bible. And Jesus responds. Who is my mother? And who is my brethren? And they're in the back of the crowd and they hear him say that. And she may not mind if you said, 
Who is my brethren? But when you say, who is my mother? I've already put up with all this because of you. Mary, can you still believe? Mary, can you still forgive? Can you forgive him? Sometimes you get mad at God. Why did you let this happen? There's people sitting here today. There's backsliders, you know, that got mad at God. Why did you let this happen? So can you forgive him for seemingly rejecting you when you ask for him, Mary? Can you forgive him for the public embarrassment that he put you and your family through? Can you forgive his brothers for the withering criticism that they are placing on him that's conflicting you because you love them and you love him? Can you forgive the religious leaders for calling him your boy that you know better, demon-possessed, insane, glutton, no account, loser, faker, liar, And then, Mary, can you forgive the public for not giving him a fair chance? And so this woman struggles like you, like everybody who has Jesus in them. She struggles through her frustrations, through her emotions, through her anger, through her fears for his Welfare through her embarrassment for the relatives. The swirl sometimes seems too much. But Mary, can you still believe? And Mary, can you still forgive? Mary, can you do these two? And finally, his death. She's there at the unfair trial. She watches. She's a beautiful woman, refined by the winnowing process of sorrow. she watches her son indicted in an unfair trial with liars and murderers and the world loving its own. Represented in Barabbas and rejecting her son. She sees, and time doesn't permit to go into all, the brutal treatment watching I think about if, if I had to watch my kids beat with whips when they didn't deserve it, spit on, hair yanked out, brutalized in every way. I believe that Mary looked around in frustration at the disciples and said, do something. But when she turned to say, do something, they were not there. Because he was abandoned. So here she crouches. It's on a feast day that the crucifixion takes place. Musicians come. And there's Jews there from every land. And they're all at the foot of the cross looking around, hundreds of them, probably several thousand. Listen closely. She looks around and their faces are etched in her mind. She sees the man spitting on her baby and she will never forget his face. She sees her boy naked 
bloody, maligned mockers sitting there she looks up and watches a brutal Roman soldier jab a spear ruthlessly into his side she remembers Gabriel and that baby in her arms as she watches blood spurt out and run down his naked body hanging in infamy and shame she's drug into it because she is his mother and then he's dead she remembered him in her womb then she remembered him in her bosom she remembered the innocency first time you got the baptism of the Holy Ghost the joy of deliverance the happiness to have Jesus it's a new thing for you she remembers nursing him as she softly rocked him there's no doubt in my mind that for her there was a surreal sense of it all from the birth announcement to now And then I believe Satan came to her and said, Hey, Mary, what about all those promises? He's dead. This is not a girl now. She is now between 48 and 55 years old. This story has covered her life. The youthful idealism that kept her going has been scraped off of her by the abrasions of living life. She's been hit so many times that she's used to being dizzy, trying to clear her head, trying to discern reality from imagination. Trying not to fall victim to that which is not real. The devil says, Mary, what about all those promises? And what about all those people that killed him? And what about all your neighbors in Nazareth? And what about the leaders, the unfair treatment? Can you still believe? Can you still forgive? But after his death, things are looking up. There's a resurrection. He's seen of over 500, 1 Corinthians 15 tells us. Somewhere along there, the Bible doesn't tell us where, his brothers and sisters all came to know and believe that he was truly the Son of God. After all their doubt, they came to believe. It was a good day for Mary. And to varying degrees, the Bible lets us know that his brothers, perhaps his sisters too, became leaders in the early church. And from the resurrection, it's on to the upper room, Acts 1, 13 and 14. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon Zelotes and Judas, the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. So all those are in the upper room, part of the 120. And the Holy Ghost falls. And Mary becomes filled with the spirit of her own son. He was born of her, now she's born of him. He's in her again. But 
this time in her spirit rather than her womb. Shall we speculate a minute? When she got the Holy Ghost, did she say, hey, I know you. This is just me, okay? Tape off. I believe she knew him. Because when you get the Holy Ghost, you don't just get some ethereal spirit of God. You get the spirit of God manifested in Jesus. I know you. I know who you are. I wonder if the Holy Ghost said, Hey, Mom. Maybe not. But, ah, uh, who knows? That abstract world of feminine intuition. And that abstract world of the Holy Spirit met in a unique way. And Mary is saying, this is so wonderful. It's validation of everything that I went through. It's so good. She's dancing and shouting with the rest of them. They are so enamored with what's happening Do you remember when you received the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Hold your hand up if you remember the ecstasy, the instant. Oh, my God, what a time it was in my personal life when I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It was a great time. But the story's not yet finished. The crowd hears. The crowd hears. It was, to use King James language, noised abroad. People heard it. The sound went out from underneath the doors, through the windows, through the walls. And a crowd gathered until finally they said, what meaneth this? And if you look in Acts 2.5, you don't have to put it on the board, but on Acts 2.5, it lets us know that there were people there because it was a feast day. There were Jews there from every land. And then it names, I think, 14 different nations. Our regions. And they're all saying, what meaneth this? These men are drunk with new wine. What is going on? What is this about the third hour of the day? And then along about verse 14 through verse 36, the apostle Peter gets up to explain what is happening. And don't miss this. Peter is saying, you know. He's saying, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. The last days I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And all the 119 others are saying, yes, 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 it's real, yes. And Peter preaches. And in verse 22, Acts 2.22, Peter says, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of ye, as ye yourselves also know. Mary looks around and says, Ye men of Israel, who's he preaching to? She looks at the crowd. She says, I've seen that guy somewhere. And horror, horror, terror comes over her as Peter continues to preach and she recognizes face after face and she remembers the spit flying on her son and the face etched into her mind that she will never forget and in horror she watches as verse 36 Peter says therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus Notice those four words, whom ye have crucified. 
He's made him both Lord and Christ. And Mary is picking them out. That face, I know him. He was saying, crucify him. You didn't even know him. And you were saying, crucify him. How could you have done this? The Holy Ghost or no Holy Ghost, something rises up in her. (laughs) My God, he's lived and born and lived and died and buried and resurrected. And I still can't escape. Those two questions that haunt me. Mary, can you still believe? Mary, can you still forgive? And it dawns on Mary that for the rest of her life, every day of her life, she will live in the church with the murderers of her baby. And every morning when she gets up, she will have to go to prayer. Mary, can you still believe? Mary, can you still forgive? Shall we stand? My little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. There is a spirit of anger unleashed in our world. There is a spirit of anger unleashed in the apostolic movement. Last week I was in a motel room trying to recover from diverticulitis. Seemed like everybody's having dreams these days, so I had mine. My family and I were at a nice hotel in this dream and we were in the front yard and they had picnic tables in the front yard of this very nice hotel we had eight extended family big group we'd ate the picnic lunch and played games and had fun and left a mess papers strewn, nothing destroyed but just didn't pick up Hotel management came out and said, Hey, 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 you got to clean up these papers and stuff. I said, Okay, let's get this cleaned up. So we proceeded to clean it up. But the staff of the hotel was angry, angry beyond rationality. And so while we were cleaning up, some of them were taunting us, saying, going to get you for leaving these papers out here leaving them I, and I said hey we're cleaning it up we're doing what we're supposed to one of them was behind me and they had been putting in uh, irrigation and there was some pipes seemed like they were 20 foot long but like 4 inch plastic pipe PVC pipe while I was bent over cleaning up one of them said I'm going to pick up one of these pipes and I'm going to ram it right into you and I told him I said I I wouldn't advise that you better just mind your own business and I turned back to work and the butt end of that pipe hit me in the back with terrific force and I turned around and when I turned around I thought this worker had done this but It was a friend that I've known for decades. And he was so angry that immediately him and other faces of his friends 
and their cadre of people that follow them swept in and surrounded me immediately. And there was so much anger in their face. One of them, he said, yeah, what are you going to do about it? And the Spirit was saying, don't touch him. But I was angry. But the Spirit still was there saying, "Uh, uh, 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 uh-uh-uh-uh-uh, don't do that. And I said, I'm just telling you, if you know what's good for you, you better never do that again. And he raised his hand, and I grabbed his wrist, and he couldn't move. And the Spirit said, don't touch him. But it was too late. I already grabbed his wrist, and then three policemen showed up and said, we don't know who's at fault, but we know who's grabbed the other guy's wrist. You are under arrest. God, a lot of people are in a very precipitous place right now. Precipitous means on the edge of a precipice. Some of you have experienced hurts and some of you have experienced wounds and some of you have been battered by stuff in life and some of you are blaming it on Jesus. You may be right. You may be right. Mary, can you give them another chance? Even though they were wrong at the foot of the cross, can you give them another chance? Mary, have you got a hold of yourself between 36 and 38? And can you agree with Peter when he's saying repent? Are you still saying no, be damned? Mary, are you going to be able to live in the kingdom of God and see these people every day and love them and know the power of your Son has forgiven and brought them to salvation? I'm going to tell you, you're not going to experience anything in your life that's going to justify grudges, bitterness, rancor, anger. You're not going to find anything that justifies that. Quit feeling sorry for yourself. Quit petting your flesh. And come to the foot of the cross say, Jesus, it's never going to end as long as I'm on earth. Through all of the stuff that we've been through, now that we're not fresh-faced kids, can you still believe? And can you still forgive? If God's talked to you today, we're going to sing a little chorus. I want you to come. And I want you to say, God, search me, know me, Try me. I really feel like there's some people here today that God has talked to. I felt it before I ever got here that there was people supposed to be here today that God was going to talk to. That has to say, God, I can't, the problems, my upbringing, the problems, my messed up situation, my church, my family, people that's done me wrong. God, all 